Well, cast your mind back, if you will, to 520 BC. Now, I suspect even the older ones amongst us can't quite remember that far back. Um, but imagine that you can. Um, some 42,000 Jews had returned from 70 years of captivity in Babylon. And they were led politically by a man called Zerubbabel and spiritually by their high priest, Joshua. And this is not the same Joshua as the one who had led Israel into the promised land, because that was the best part of a thousand years before. And when they had arrived back in Israel, or the Judah area, uh, a few years back, they had set out to rebuild the temple, which is a great noble priority. And it started with the foundations being laid. However, there was opposition from their enemies. There was division within the Jews. So after a year or so, the work on the temple stopped because their enemies had managed to obtain an order from the Persian government to halt the work. It was some 16 years before the work restarted. And the Jews therefore started to rebuild their own houses instead. In view of that, God sent two prophets to reignite their zeal for him and to shake them out of their complacency. Something I guess we could do with in our nation today, perhaps. One of those was Haggai and two months later, the other was Zechariah. Haggai wrote only 38 verses over two chapters, but that doesn't mean that his message was small. And Zechariah wrote 14 chapters, and it's his book that we're going to study over the next coming weeks. So our first session is today. And the messages achieved success because the work on the temple resumed and it was completed around 515 BC. There's an element of what is called apocalyptic style in Zechariah with visions and pictures and symbols. So it has some similarities with Daniel in that regard. But Daniel was born in Jerusalem and was taken captive to Babylon, whilst Zechariah was born in Babylon and moved back to Jerusalem to give his prophecies. In order to give a bit more background, I think it's useful to understand the context of what God was doing with the Jews around this time. Because of their disobedience to God. There were three overlapping periods of judgments in relation to the Jews in the period between 606 BC and 516 BC. Um, if you're good at maths you'll know that's 90 years and the period involved that was spoken of uh, uh, in Der Jeremiah and Daniel spoke about was a period of 70 years but they were overlapping so We'll see how it goes in a moment. Uh, and in studying historical books like this, like Daniel and Zechariah, I think it's important to distinguish between the three sections of judgments of servitude, of captivity, and desolations. First, servitude. Because of national sin, Judah was brought under servitude to Babylon for 70 years in the third year of Jehoiakim in 606 to 605 BC. And on that occasion, Nebuchadnezzar left the city and the people pretty much undisturbed, taking only a relatively few prisoners, such as Daniel and his three companions. Two, there was captivity. Because the people of Judah didn't respond to the servitude, in 598 to 597 BC, Nebuchadnezzar returned and he deported the mass of the inhabitants to Chaldea, another name for Babylon. And that was the group in which Ezekiel was a member. He was deported. And then thirdly, we have desolations. Nebuchadnezzar returned a third time in between 589 to 586 and he besieged Jerusalem. That's why it took a few years. Uh, and eventually destroying the temple and the city and the rest of the inhabitants were removed to Babylon. But what struck me as I was thinking about this this morning was that even in 
the exile, in the discipline that involved the exile because of their disobedience, God showed grace. Because we've got three stages. The first stage was relatively mild. And God showed grace. But they wouldn't repent. So God turned the heat up, showing more grace for a few more years. But they still wouldn't repent. And so God turned the heat up again and the exile was brought into, act, in, in, into effect and the temple was destroyed and so was much of the city. And it made me think that we live in a world that has so turned away from God. God has shown grace to our nation, to the Western world, and much of the world. But when you read that last year, 55% of all deaths were through abortion beating by a large measure the COVID pandemic that has caused so much havoc in the world. But what mention do we get of abortion? Surely God uh, needs to judge. We live in a world that must cause him such distress. Anyway, moving back to our, uh, our book, the periods of both servitude and captivity were ended with the decree of Cyrus in 536 BC. And if you're good at maths, you realize that that is 70 years from the beginning. And that permitted the exiles to return. But according to Daniel 9 verse 2, it was the 70 years of the desolation period that formed the basis of the prophecy of the 70 weeks that uh, we heard about. And this 70 year period, um, was prophesied in Jeremiah 25, 11 to 14, and also in Jeremiah 29, 8 to 14. The time of the desolations commenced with the besieging of the city of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, which was the 10th day of the 10th month of the ninth year of Zedekiah. And that ended on the 24th day of the ninth month of the second year of Darius. And that period was exactly 70 Jewish years. And we need to remember that the Jews have and had a slightly different calendar from ours. Um, so that may not, on the face of it, make, make sense to 70 years, but believe me, it does work out that way. And it was a few years after that that Zedekiah's ministry started. And Zedekiah's prophetic ministry commenced in the reign of Darius, Istaspis, it's not an easy word to say that, um, and his dates were 522 to 486 BC. He was the ruler of the Medes and the Persians. And at that time, the Persian Empire was highly civilized and pro-Semitic. But by the time that Alexander the Great took, it, took over the empire 200 years later, when he defeated the Medes and the Persians, it had become quite decadent. And unlike many of the previous prophets who marked the timing of their ministry by reference to which kings were ruling in Israel, Zechariah couldn't do that because there were no kings in Israel. They were being ruled under the, by the Medo-Persians. Zechariah was not an uncommon name uh, in those days. Um, I haven't actually counted, but apparently there are 27, some say 28 Zechariahs mentioned in the Bible. Uh, his name means Jehovah remembers, which I think is a fitting name, as that's a good theme for the book. Jehovah has remembered them. It starts with the returning remnant from Babylon, reminding us that God had remembered them despite their disobedience, despite their exile that he'd, he'd sent them into. It ends with prophecies about the millennium, when God will again have visibly remembered his people Israel. He was called to encourage and to mobilize God's people to accomplish a task that they had begun, but they'd lost the momentum for, to bring it to completion. We learn from verse one in chapter one, that Ze Zechariah was the son of Berechiah, the grandson of Iddo, and this was one of the priestly families of Levi. And there are three main sections to the book. 
Chapters 1 to 6 comprise eight visions to comfort Jerusalem. Chapters 77 to 8 deal with fasting. And 9 to 14 comprise some glorious teaching on the second coming of Christ and his reign in Israel following his return. And that section, the last section, is widely quoted in the New Testament. And it's regarded, uh, the book is regarded as being a very messianic book. It has much to say prophetically about Jesus as the coming Messiah, uh, and that's second only to Isaiah in that regard. So with that background, let's get into the book. Let's look at the introduction, verses 1 to 6 to start with. In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet, saying, The Lord has been very angry with your fathers. Therefore, say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets preached, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, turn now from your evil ways and your evil deeds, but they did not heed, hear nor heed me, says the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they returned and said, just as the Lord of hosts determined to do to us, according to our ways and according to our deeds, so he has dealt with us. And in verse one, Zechariah introduces himself and he dates the prophecy, uh, which as we have seen is 520 BC. And their eighth month, which was spoken of, started on our October the 27th. And the fact that he dated his prophecy according to the reign of a Gentile monarch is a reminder that the times of the Gentiles that Daniel had spoken of were in progress because there was no king reigning in Jerusalem. And even in verse one, we have a hint of the message because as we have seen, Zechariah means Jehovah remembers. And then Berechiah, his father's name means Jehovah will bless. And Ido, the grandfather, means at the appointed time. So he can therefore say that God hadn't forgotten his people. And he quickly moves on to tell them to return to their God in verse 3. And in verse 2, he reminds the people that God had been very angry with their fathers. The poor behaviour of their ancestors had seriously displeased God, such that he fulfilled his warning of exile, so they had been taken to Babylon for 70 years. And in effect, Zechariah begins by telling the Israelites not to repeat uh, the failures of their fathers, but instead to turn to God, so that he would turn to them. And the turning here involves both attitude and behaviour. That's always the case with repentance. That which is decided in the mind will affect our behaviour. We've got to live it as well as just believe it. The people had slipped into complacency by not rebuilding the temple, focusing instead on their own homes. So they too had to repent and return to the Lord. It's very easy for us to slide into complacency too. All too often we don't even realise we're doing it. And each generation needs to walk closely with God to keep their faith alive so that he can work through his people without the need for discipline. God looks for sincere, willing and wholehearted disciples and he'll work in his people to produce that. It's not dissimilar, I guess, to the message of James 4, verse 8, when he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And that message echoes down to our day because God wants a people who are clean before him, those with pure hearts that are not double-minded. And that means repentance for each one of us. A double-minded person has one foot in the world and one in Christ. 
but it's never a successful way of living and nor is it acceptable to God. He wants our whole heart. But what grace from God, as the people were called to return to him, he would return to them. Because he loves to be in a good and a vibrant relationship with his people. But it shows us again that he will not draw near to us if we're double-minded, showing us the futility of being half-hearted towards God. He wants our freely given love and devotion. And it's so much better to respond to the carrot approach um, that we love him for who he is, resulting in un untold blessings for eternity, rather than the stick approach where God has to bring discipline to drive us back to him. God will not coerce man's free will, but he will sometimes put pressure on us to help us choose as we should. We must respond to the Holy Spirit's conviction or we will not be useful to God. Some of us here are old enough to remember cars with a bench seat at the front as well as the back. Remember, you've got the, at the back, you've got the, the three seats. In the olden days, I can remember it as a child, we had a car that had seats as a bench in the front. And the story is told of an elderly couple who drove down the road in their car with the front bench seat. And as they drove, the wife noticed that in many of the other cars with couples in the front seat, the woman sat close to the man as he drove. And she asked her husband, why is it that we don't sit that close anymore? He simply answered, it wasn't me that moved. And if we are far from God, he's not the one who's moved, but he calls us to come back. And if we want to be close to God, we must be obedient to him and we must develop godly character and live for him. In verse four, once again, Zechariah warns the Israelites not to be like their fathers. These fathers had been warned by various prophets over the years, over centuries, as the prophets spoke God's word to them calling them to turn from their evil ways and deeds. The people that Zechariah spoke to here knew their history, and the very fact of their presence in Jerusalem meant that they were the ones, actually, who were most concerned for God's restoration program, because the others had stayed in Babylon at the end of the captivity. And they were told to learn from history, which so few people do. Our own generation has fallen into the same trap, forgetting how our nation prospered when we have had God involved in a national life. We've deliberately flouted God's ways, and we then wonder why our nation is no longer blessed by God. God had to turn the heat up for Israel because of their disobedience. And he'll do the same for this country too. And I think in many ways he has done so. And God's verdict through Zechariah was that the Israelites of old did not hear nor heed him. And we must learn the same lesson. And to drive the point home, in verse 5, God asks where their fathers were. Do they live forever? And the obvious answer is that they don't. Their lives had ended on this earth in stark contrast to our God who lives forever. And given our limitations with the brevity of life uh, compared to God's eternality, is it not reasonable to accept that God's wisdom is far greater than ours? So why not follow him and do what he wants? And God also mentioned that the prophets too don't live forever. And that was a rather pointed reminder that some of the earlier prophets have been killed by the people to whom they ministered. Our lives are brief, and that brings an urgency to active discipleship and to witness, because the ones we're ministering to, or witnessing to, also have brief lives. And he brings that out in verse 6, where God asks, Yet surely my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? And God has spoken through his prophets, he pronounced a coming judgment, and it came to pass because the, uh, because the Israelites had not heeded his words and his statutes. 
And in the second part of the verse, it seems that some of the fathers had repented, but it was too late to prevent God's righteous judgment. And sometimes repentance can only involve an acceptance that we are in the wrong if, if the point of no return has been reached in a situation. But actually God calls for a complete turnabout to follow him and leave behind our sinful ways. The Jews here acknowledged that God had acted as he intended, but it was according to the ways and the deeds of the people that they deserved what came their way. And by calling the people to repent, Zechariah was preparing the people for what God was going to do to bring through the prophecies that he was about to speak. God calls sinners to repent, to come for salvation, but there are times when he also calls his own people to repent, when they've drifted from the wholehearted obedience that he looks for. And for God to bless us as his people, we need to be the type of people that he can bless. And that's people who walk closely with their God with a pure heart. Anything less is pretense. And God doesn't give comfort or blessing to unrepentant hearts. And we then come to Zechariah's first vision. Uh, he gave eight visions in the first six chapters. Uh, the first vision is in verses 7 to 17. Although uh, scholars tend to the view, I think it seems to be the case, that all eight visions were given in a single night. Must have been a long night. Um, and he says in verse 7, On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month Shebat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, the son of Iddo the prophet. I saw by night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow. And behind him were horses, red, sorrel, and white. Then I said, My Lord, what are these? So the angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. And the man who stood among the myrtle trees answered and said, These are the ones whom the Lord has sent to walk to and fro throughout the earth. So they answered the angel of the Lord, who stood among the men, myrtle trees, and said, We have walked to and fro throughout the earth, and behold, all the earth is resting quietly. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these seventy years? And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel who spoke with me said to me, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. I am exceedingly angry with the nations at ease, for I was a little angry, and they helped, but with evil intent. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts, and a surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Again proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, My cities shall again spread out throughout, throughout, through prosperity. The Lord will again comfort Zion and will again choose Jerusalem. Zechariah specifies when he received this vision. He, he puts it down to the date of the month. And scholars have dated it to be the 15th of February, 519 BC. Uh, that's in our calendar. The Jews, obviously, as I said, had a different calendar. God spoke to Zechariah by night. It was a vision rather than a dream. Uh, from Haggai, we know that the rebuilding of the temple had recommenced a few months before this. And there's a pattern in these visions of introductory words, a description of what Zechariah saw, followed by a question to an angel for the meaning and a reply from the angel. We find what he saw in verse 8 following, and it was a man riding a red horse, and it stood among the myrtle trees in the hollow, which could be a ravine. These trees were probably pre prevalent in the Kidron Valley to the east-southeast of Jerusalem, so possibly that was the location being referred to. And they were leading other horses, red, sorrel and white. 
So the, the actual picture is not complicated. Uh, more challenging, perhaps, to draw the cor correct conclusion as to the, what the meaning is. And there's a debate amongst scholars and commentators as to whether these horses are linked to the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation 6. Uh, but the colours don't seem to match up. There's no black horse mentioned by Zechariah. Um, for those who are not familiar with horses, sorrel is a light brown to brownish orange colour or without wishing to be rude to horse lovers, some suggest it could be a dirty yellow as an option. Um, and we know that the man among the myrtle trees here is the angel of the Lord. And that is usually a reference to a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God. And that's confirmed in fact in chapter three, verse two, which we'll see in a few weeks time, where this angel is referred to as the Lord. And he also forgave sins in chapter 3, verse 4, which only God can do. So it does seem to be the Lord himself. And thankfully, we also have an interpreting angel who gives some explanation to Zechariah. We learn that the horsemen had been sent by the Lord to go through the earth, presumably as a sort of rec reconnaissance to give a report on what they saw. And they'd found the earth to be resting quietly although it wasn't a piece that pleased God. The myrtle tree is a form of laurel. It's evergreen and it's often seen as a picture of Israel. And the fact that the pre-incarnate Jesus is among the myrtle trees reminds us of his identification with Israel, the nation which God has chosen. The angel of the Lord intercedes for Jerusalem and Judah in verse 12, when it says, Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which you were angry these 70 years? This is actually a fairly unusual uh, action in Old Testament prophecy, as the angel of the Lord is usually representing God to the people in the Old Testament, rather than interceding for them before God. But by addressing the Lord of hosts, or in some versions, the Lord Almighty, it reminds us of the distinction of the persons of the Trinity. We've got God the Son speaking to God the Father. But there's full unity of purpose. He asks for mercy. The 70 years of captivity in Babylon were over. So God's anger against them was justifiably spent. Therefore, mercy is requested instead because the city still needed to be rebuilt. But I think it's such a blessing for us as believers to know that Jesus has fully taken God's anger against our sins so that we have received mercy from God instead. And that surely reminds us of the pressing need for unbelievers to come to, to understand and know the truth of the gospel. Everyone needs that mercy, whether they realise it or not. And in verses 13 to 14, the Lord gave good and comforting words. He said that the angel told Zechariah to cry out, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am zealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with great zeal. God's discipline of them was over, and now he was jealous for them with great zeal. And as we saw uh, yesterday in, in, in Matt's message, God's jealousy is not sinful. It's pure. Um, it's more like a man being rightly jealous for his wife and her affection. And God was again able to continue his plans for Israel now that they had returned from captivity. And furthermore, God, in verse 15, God says that he is exceedingly angry with the nations at ease. And it seems that these nations had overstepped their poor treatment of Israel when God was disciplining them. So now the other nations, in turn, were incurring God's wrath. And that's been a recurring pattern in history, because God has sometimes used foreign powers to discipline Israel. But when the harsh treatment of that discipline was taken too far, God turned on the nations who had become anti-Semitic. 
and consequently God was going to deal with Israel for their good, which we find in verses 16 and 17. He would show mercy to Jerusalem so that the temple would be rebuilt. The surveyor's line would be stretched out over the city, suggesting a good deal of building work. And the cities would spread out with prosperity because God would be blessing them. And then God said that he would comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. He would be true to his covenant with Israel now that the needed discipline had taken place. And it was only about four years after this prophecy was given that the temple was rebuilt and God did indeed bless Israel again. Now, whilst much of this is history, there's a prophetic element here because God will continue his blessing of Israel in the millennium. Yes, there's the discipline and God's wrath in the tribulation, but it will be used to draw Israel back to God. And in the millennium too, there will be great blessing for Israel as Jesus himself will reign from Jerusalem. God has still chosen Israel with its capital city of Jerusalem and no one will be able to challenge God on that when his purposes come to fruition. God's purposes will never be thwarted, despite the opposition that the enemy throws at them. And when Jesus reigns from Jerusalem, a further new temple will be built. But this time, God's glory will return here, because it never filled the second temple that was being built in Zechariah's day. And the context of the beginning of this book shows God's sovereignty as the temple was, uh, as he brought Israel back to their land. And the historical events spoken of by Zechariah here again show God's sovereignty as the temple was built again and Israel prospered. The future fulfillment will also show God's sovereignty as he will once more prosper Israel and there will be another temple, and the blessing for them then will be greater than they have known to date. It's so wonderful to have, to love, and to serve a God who is in full control of history and world events. I guess the question for us is, will we believe his word such that it moulds and directs our lives? Will we trust him? with every aspect of our lives now, and also with our eternal future. There is no safer place to put our trust, and no one else is worthy of our trust. He is God, and we are his people. And may our whole outlook be thoroughly God-centred, so that our lives are lived for his glory. Israel blew it. They had to go into exile and discipline. May we be those who put God first, so we don't have to be disciplined. Let's live for him. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you so much for this beginning of the book. Thank you, Lord, for the, the riches in this book. And thank you, Lord, that you remembered your people. You remembered what you'd said you would do for them. You remembered your covenant with them. And you brought them back to the land. And you have still remembered Israel. You've once again brought them back to the land. And Lord, their, their best years are yet to come. They're, they're, yes, we know there are troubles, but there's, there's a great future for them, just as there's a great future for us as Christians. Lord, help us to just get, out, get your word in our hearts, in our minds. Help us to determine that whatever else is going on in the world, we will follow you. We will put you first. We will live for you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.